Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 400 of the Juice Box podcast. Just recently, I had my first episode with someone who was speaking specifically about how they ate. I believe it was with Jordan, and she was a vegan. Since then, I've been recording more and more episodes with people that are focused around their different eating styles. When the opportunity to have Dr. Paul Saladino come on the show. Now, Paul has an incredibly popular carnivore podcast. So while he does not have type 1 diabetes, he can explain the concept of carnivore eating very, very granularly. So I thought I'd have him on to pick his brain. A huge group of people in the private Facebook group, Juicebox Podcast Type 1 Diabetes, sent in questions for Paul, and we did our best to get through them. Please remember as you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan. And please remember this as well. I have no vested interest in how you eat. I'm just trying to shine a light on how we eat. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries. Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. This episode is also sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. Find out more at contournext.com forward slash juice box. To give you a little background so you kind of know why I reached out to you, because I'm the father of a child with type 1 diabetes. I don't have diabetes myself. My daughter was diagnosed when she was two. I wrote a blog about it for a decade, and as the years went by, I started recognizing I had a a system. I had a system that I knew if I did certain things at certain times and understood how insulin worked, that she could eat anything she wanted, and I was able to maintain an A1C in in the mid to low fives most of the time, honestly. What was the system? Tell me about it. It just all bases around understanding how man made insulin works. Okay. The problem ends up being, I think for most people, is that they count their carbs, right? And then they say, the doctor told me that I know I one unit is for 10 carbs, so I'm having 30 carbs. I put in three units. They don't recognize that the insulin doesn't begin to work right away. That you right. have that you have to get the insulin in a in a pre bolus situation so that as the insulin's beginning to, you know, to work, it works as the food is starting to try to drive up your blood sugar. And then I noticed that people also didn't understand that their basal insulin was very important. People with type 1 diabetes, right? So, you know, they'd they'd be using a half a unit an hour when they needed three quarters of a unit an hour, whatever it was to keep basic life, body functions, you know, quelled. And then I think the third most important thing is that they don't understand the impact of food, the glycemic load and the glycemic index of some food. So they'll count... 10 carbs of watermelon and bolus it the same way they would count, you know, 10 carbs of rice. And those things don't, don't work the same. The rice stays in your system longer. It impacts your blood sugar longer. Sometimes long after the insulin that you put in is gone, it drives your blood sugar up and they don't understand because they counted their carbs and they put in their insulin. So that's kind of the basis of it. I'm, I, I don't not believe that there aren't better ways to eat for specific people's bodies. And I'm certainly not telling you that I think that the standard American diet is in any way healthy. My goal was just to understand that there were going to be people who ate all different ways and that none of them deserve not to have blood sugars that were in range because they didn't understand how the insulin works. That was pretty much it. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, it's tough to use man-made insulin and mimic the way the body does it, but we do the best we can. Yeah. Uh, and it's come out, I'll tell you that most of the people that listen to this podcast achieve A1Cs pretty easily in the sixes, and the people that really work on it get it into the fives. Mm-hmm. Um, but r- more recently, because I, I really do come from a background of not telling people how to do things, I wanted to start shining a light on how different people eat. So I have recently recorded with a vegan. I've recently recorded with somebody who did keto, and if I'm being honest, I always see you, uh, you know, about 10 slots ahead of me in the Apple podcast chart in, in uh, medicine. And I'm always like, that guy's constantly there talking about carnivore. And my first thought was, I wonder if he could shed some light on what people with type 1 diabetes see. We call it a fat and protein rise. So, you know, and I, and I first thought that, but then I went back to my community online. I was like, hey, if I had this guy on, would you have questions? And they just ask so many questions. So I'd like you to tell me a little bit about how you eat. Well, where do you want to start? Well, I think that 
the first question that people said was, you know, you talk about a carnivore based diet. Can you just define what that is? Yeah, I think it can be different things to different people. And over the amount of time that I've been researching and talking about animal based diets, my own views have evolved um, and changed. I think that the the basic premise that I've come to, and people will hear this if they listen to the recent Joe Rogan podcast is that if you look at indigenous cultures and you look at human evolution, if you look at where humans have come from, which I think can inform the way that we should be eating as humans in 2020, um, indigenous cultures and anthropologic and ethnographic evidence from our ancestors suggests that animal foods have been favored preferentially for millions of years. And probably you can make a really convincing argument that the inclusion of more animal foods in the human diet about 2 million years ago was probably the single biggest catalyst in the growth of the human brain and was a major selective pressure to make humans who we are today. I would suggest that the reason we are human is because we began hunting and eating animals more. There are tons of adaptations on my website, which is heartandsoil.co. There is a a show notes page for the Rogan episode, which has all this evidence and the anthropology and many of the things I'll talk about today Mm. are linked there under headings if people want to go back to those. So I may reference that a number of times. We put a lot of work into that site. Okay. But there's a lot of anthropologic evidence there. You can even look at the the way that the human eye is structured relative to a chimpanzee eye, the human throwing arm. Um, A chimpanzee eye has a black or a dark sclera relative to the iris. And so You can't differentiate the direction that a chimpanzee is looking like you can with a human. We have a light sclera. And so the hypothesis here is that in in humans, as we were becoming more uh, evolved, we were sort of deciding to become um, uh, uh, like uh, cooperative species as opposed to a competitive species. And many of the things we cooperated on were probably hunting or evasion from predators. So we were hunting, we were letting other animals know which direction we were looking without making any sounds with a lighter sclera. Of course, we don't know exactly why it happened, but it's a striking finding that a chimpanzee has a dark sclera and you can't really tell what direction they're looking by looking at their eyes and humans have a light sclera. Anyway, this is all to the point that meat and organs are invariably favored by humans as valuable food. And we, if we want to thrive as humans, if we want to get the nutrients that we need, we should not listen to the mainstream rhetoric, which is wrong, um, that meat and organs are bad for us or that they harm us in any way. It's based on bad science that's badly done and misinterpreted and then parroted without actually digging into the interventional studies. Okay. So one of the people in the email you sent me asked a question, can you talk about the evidence that meat is inflammatory? It's it's a very short conversation because there is no evidence that meat is inflammatory. And it wouldn't make sense for meat to be inflammatory if humans have been eating it as the majority of our diet, specifically meat and organs eating nose to tail for millions of years. So there's no interventional studies that I'm aware of or that I've ever seen that anyone's ever been able to show me in humans that show that meat or organs or animal fat are inflammatory. These foods are what are meant to be eaten by humans. And by so, meant to be, you mean it's it's how we evolved. It's, it's yeah. yeah, it's just, it's what happened enough times. In our, do you, so do you think, this is crazy maybe, but do you think if we ate Pop-Tarts for a million years, our bodies would evolve to handle them eventually? Or do you think that would be too much for us and it would overwhelm us? I, who knows what would happen? Yeah. But if there were selective pressures and the only thing available for humans were Pop-Tarts, maybe the people that do best on Pop-Tarts would thrive if there were actually a selective pressure for that. I got it. But it's hard to see. But that's what you would have to do. You would have to select the genetics in the people who thrive. We may be, it's also possible that we are so far from using Pop Tarts as optimal food for humans that we would just die out. It might kill us before we got used to it. Right. Yeah. And this has happened. And so I didn't talk about this on the Joe Rogan episode. We didn't have time. But if you look at the anthropologic evidence, the oldest common fossil is felt to be Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis, another Australopithecus species. And it looks like Australopithecus diverged into at least two subspecies, Homo habilis and Paranthropus. And we don't hear about Paranthropus because Paranthropus went extinct, but there were hominid species from Australopithecus that appear to have gone extinct. Now, in the literature, and the links to this are all on the website, it looks like Homo hab, or excuse me, Australopithecus was eating a lot of different foods, eating some plants and some animals. And the Homo habilis direction of the lineage 
began to eat more animals mm -hmm. and the Paranthropus lineage began to eat more plants. So we went from chimpanzees and bonobos, which appear to be the common human ancestor to a split, uh, excuse me, to an, an ancestor like Australopithecus, which was eating more meat and some plants on the African savanna. And then a diversion again into more meat eating and less meat eating. And the less meat eating species went extinct. So you would think that something about the environment wasn't suited to that. That species didn't work well on the plains and appears to have gone extinct. And we can tell this by stable isotopes from the teeth of these species. Mm -hmm. So the lineage of humans appears to have come from a, a group of our hominid ancestors that were specialized or well adapted to eating meat. So a carnivore diet for me has become about understanding these things. Where have we come from? What are we adapted to be eating? Red meat, organs, incorrectly vilified. These are the centerpiece of every human diet that we need if we're going to thrive. Now, the second piece of the equation is that plants exist on a toxicity spectrum and really are not as benign. So it's the opposite of what we've been told. They're not as benign as we've been told they are. I just don't think that there's good evidence that plant leaves or plant seeds are benevolent for humans. And there are many downsides of these foods that we're never told about. Lots of different toxins in these foods. So the second piece of the equation is understanding that there is individual toxicity of plants and plants exist on a toxicity spectrum. And if we really want to thrive, we should understand the way that certain plants might be creating toxicity in a human. Okay. Like what kinds? Like you're not telling me like romaine lettuce is trying to kill me, right? Or, well, or, or, in, a, in a way it is actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, think about it from the perspective of a plant. Does a, does a romaine lettuce plant want you to eat its leaf? No. It's going to put things in there that are going to dissuade you or any other animal or bug or organism that eat from over consuming it. Now, humans have gotten pretty smart and we've figured out ways to sort of breed the most toxic chemicals out of many of these plants. But yeah. I'm, I would say romaine lettuce is one of the least toxic things out there, but it's just, it's not a plant food that the plant is actually trying to get you to eat. It's, it's purposefully putting things in there that are bad for you. Yeah. Kale is a good example. Kale has a great publicist, but it just doesn't love you back. Kale is a leaf of a brassica plant. And there are tons of things in kale specifically goitrogenic compounds called isothiocyanates that are found throughout the plant kingdom that are specifically put there by the plant to dissuade animals from over consuming them. Hmm. Um, and they have many mechanisms in the human body by which they're acting in a, in a negative way, specifically interfering with the absorption of iodine, the level of the thyroid, directly oxidizing phospholipids, et cetera. But the intention of the plant and the, the way it's, acting with these defense chemicals is very clear. So the third piece of the equation, which will be important for your listeners, especially, but really anyone, is that there are a few types of food that have crept into the human diet in a very subtle way that I think are evolutionarily inconsistent. And these are acting in a very negative way. We don't think of them necessarily as plant foods, but many of them are derived from plants. The things I'm thinking about here are specifically seed oils, things like corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, uh, soybean oils. And my concern with these is that they are very high in an omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid called linoleic acid, which appears to break both our mitochondrial electron transport chain signaling, the way that our fat cells are meant to um, signal and divide, and also our mitochondria at a membrane level um, uh, in both the inner and the outer membrane of the mitochondria. So evolutionarily inconsistent consumption of food is what I'm talking about here. Okay. The overarching idea is what is an evolutionarily consistent diet for humans? What is a species appropriate diet for humans? And how many ways have we gone away from that? Well, to summarize, we've gone away from that by eating less meat and organs because we've been told they're bad for us, eating less fat from animals, eating less of the connective tissue of animals, by eating more plants, which are highly defended and really not great sources of nutrients, mostly full of defense chemicals, and by eating things like seed oils and processed sugars, which none of your listeners will be great fans of, I'm sure. There's a lot of evolutionarily, evolutionary inconsistencies in the way that humans are eating that I'm really calling into question. So that's a long-winded answer to your question about what a carnivore diet is or, or what it means for me and, and what I'm sort of driving at with my message. No, I think that's perfect to understand where you're coming from. Uh, I have to say that after seeing um, her, I'm going to blank on her name, but I, I saw a woman on the Bill Maher show maybe this uh, a number of months ago, talk about seed oils 
And I took what she said to heart. Like, like, and so I've, I've eliminated every oil in the house. Um, you know, if I need oil, I'm using uh, cold pressed, non processed olive oil. It's the only, and I even, I think maybe you would tell me not to use that, but I have eliminated all of the others out of my diet. Um, and I, I, I don't understand how those oils are bad. And I think most people don't either. So, is it really marketing that I believe in my mind that canola oil is the best oil in the world? Like, like, is that just somebody telling me that? And I believe it after I hear it enough times. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of debate here. It's a deep rabbit hole, mm -hmm. but I think that canola oil has been foist upon us as Americans for the last 70 years, hand in hand with the demonization of saturated fat. And that's a whole separate story about why saturated fat is incredibly healthy for humans, right. why are, there are unique saturated fats like stearic acid in animal fat or more complex named fats like pentadecanoic acid in animal fat specifically that seem to have very valuable and indispensable roles in the human physiology that are left out when we shun animal fat. This all kind of began with Ansel Keys in the 1960s. And with the demonization of saturated fat is the... Um, the sort of praising or the adulation going to unsaturated fat, polyunsaturated vegetable oils. This is all kind of um, corroborated or shored up by the notion that polyunsaturated vegetable oils lower LDL cholesterol, which has also been demonized for decades. But again, I would call that into question and say, what's the real evidence that LDL is a bad thing or that tracking LDL going up and down really is an indicator or associated with the development of cardiovascular disease, I think it's an extremely poor indicator. And if you really dig into that rabbit hole, you'll notice that if you fill yourself with polyunsaturated vegetable oils, even though your LDL goes down, more valuable indicators like oxidized LPL or LP little a go up. And what we are learning, um, though it's not mainstream knowledge this time, is that LDL is a horrible predictor of cardiovascular disease but oxidized LDL, oxidized phospholipids on ApoB or LP little a are pretty good predictors of cardiovascular disease. Those things move in the wrong direction when you eat polyunsaturated fat, right. but nobody's really talking about this because we've become so hyper-focused on LDL. And again, it goes hand in hand with this long demonization for saturated fat for really no clear reason. It's It's been exonerated recently by the... American Association, one of the cardiologic associations, but the mainstream is still very bought into this kind of propaganda that saturated fat is bad for humans. Th this one indicator in your blood test has to be lower. You're going to have a heart attack and that's that. And single, and that's a it. single blood indicator that's looked at in a very myopic way. Yeah. People I, are not thinking about it from a contextual basis. So I'm not, I don't subscribe to any specific way of eating, although I can tell you that uh, I booked you about a week ago. And as a test, a week ago, I just started eating meat and nothing else for a week. And I will tell okay. you, I am seven pounds lighter than I was last week. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's not exactly how I would recommend you do it, but... Uh. I needed something to talk about with you. So, um, And I would tell you that I do notice a lot of what people talk about. My energy is good. I don't miss carbs once they're gone. Um, and I think of carbs mainly as sugar because be, I have to be, you know, beyond bread... I don't think I'm a really carb person, you know, like uh, I don't eat cookies, but if you gave me a cookie, I'd eat all of the cookies. I don't have like a, you know, like there's no gauge in there from that. I, I, I am never going to be a person who's like, oh my goodness, a cookie. I'll have this cookie and walk away. But what I, what I learned years ago uh, when the Atkins diet was incredibly popular and tried it and found it really valuable for weight loss, the one thing I had to keep telling myself while I was doing it, and I don't know if I was wrong or not. But I can't eat these other carbs right now because as long as I'm eating these meats and the fats and everything, my body was processing it fine. But the minute you add in some sugar or some carbs or some flour, your body all of a sudden, it feels like it holds everything in. And I don't know how to quantify that. And I wanted to ask you about it. Like, why does my body begin to retain water and my energy go down when I have like white flour and things like that in my diet? Is there a reason? Well, probably. I mean, white flour is from wheat. Wheat is full of gluten, which is a lectin. There's both a gliadin and a glutenin component to gluten. And wheat is a grain, right? Wheat is a seed. It's very highly defended. And the lectin, which is a carbohydrate binding protein in wheat, is one of the more highly studied lectins 
in medicine today, and it's a very immunogenic protein. So okay. I do think this is a good segue into discussing carbohydrates. And I'm not dogmatic to the extent that I think that a carnivore or carnivore-ish diet needs to be low carb per se. I think that low carbohydrate diets can be beneficial for some people. We should talk about it in the context of type one diabetes. Yeah. That's one context where I think a low carbohydrate diet can be very helpful. And I'll come back to that because I've specifically seen many type one diabetics do very well with animal based diets that are low in carbohydrates. But generally speaking, I'm not vilifying carbohydrates on their own per se. Mm -hmm. I think there are certain types of carbohydrates, white flour, refined sugars, specifically wheat with wheat gluten and other lectins that do not play well with human physiology. Okay. There are just too many immunogenic antigens like gluten, um, like lectins that are, that are not going to be good for you with wheat. Now, whether or not you would have the same reaction to a sweet potato or white rice, which has had the hull stripped away and is a grain, which has in some ways been detoxified a little bit is questionable. And that would be an interesting thing to look at whether you would have the same reaction to that. But you, when you're thinking about carbohydrates, it's important or at least valuable to consider how ancestrally consistent they are and how our ancestors ate them. Certainly seasonally, our ancestors did eat fruit um, when it was available. And if you think about a plant, a plant is living in the ground, it's rooted in the ground. It doesn't want you to eat its stem, its leaves, its seeds, or its roots. And those are often very toxic on plants. Um, there are many toxic roots out there like cassava. There are some roots that we find in our culture today that have been detoxified, but there are many toxic plants. There are many toxic seeds. But if you look at fruit, generally speaking, much more fruit is edible for humans than not. There is some toxic fruit out there, but there's a lot of non-toxic fruit in the world as well. And many ancestral cultures, indigenous cultures consume fruit or honey. Now, Caveat, for someone whose pancreas doesn't produce insulin, eating a bunch of fruit or honey may not be a very good thing frequently, right? But for, for those whose pancreas is, pancreae, do work well, in the context of a pancreas that works well, carbohydrates do not cause diabetes. I should say type 2 diabetes, in my opinion. I think there's no evidence of that. And there are many indigenous cultures, the Tukasinta, the Katavans, etc., who eat moderate to large amounts of carbohydrates and remain metabolically healthy. Now we're shifting a little bit here to type one, type, excuse me, type two diabetes, mm -hmm. which is metabolic health and insulin resistance versus type one. But in your case, if you are eating just meat, that's really interesting. A lot of people will lose a lot of weight when they go to a ketogenic or low carbohydrate diet because the glycogen stores in their muscles shift and you could lose water weight. I do think that if you continue this diet, you will lose adipose tissue in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, I would not recommend eating just meat. I would recommend eating organs, <laughs> eating nose to tail, okay. getting, getting all of the pieces of the animal because our ancestors and indigenous cultures don't just eat the meat. They eat the bones and they make bone broth and they eat the organs. There are unique nutrients in those things. An animal is essentially a huge multivitamin, but you must eat it nose to tail. Now, some people don't want to eat things like liver or heart or other organs, which is why desiccated organs are valuable. That's why I built uh, Heart and Soil, which is my company. We make desiccated organs. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the website earlier, it's heartandsoil.co. If people are listening to this and you want to include more organs in your diet because they have unique nutrients that are not found in the muscle meat, um, but you don't want to actually eat the organs. If you can get the fresh organs, that's great. But a lot of people it's, they're not ready for that. So you're I wanted talking, to bridge that gap. You're talking about supplements. Like you're not going to send me a bunch of calf livers in the mail or something like that, right? I'm going to send you, uh, <laughs> what, what I would send you in the mail is a bunch of calf liver and heart and spleen and pancreas that's been freeze dried and put into a capsule. Gotcha. Yeah. That, that seems more palatable for the mail system at the very least. <laughs> it's, it's more palatable for most people. And many of those organs are difficult to obtain in general for people. But if you can get the fresh organs, they're valuable. And right. so just to drive that point home, Animal meat is very nutritious, but it doesn't have everything that humans need to thrive, all of the micronutrients. Mm -hmm. So weight loss is about a couple of things. Weight loss is about calories. It's about satiety. Um, and for diabetics, they're thinking about macronutrients, how much fat, how much protein, how many carbohydrates. That's important. But thriving long-term is really about micronutrients. Where are we getting selenium, folate, vitamin B12, biotin, riboflavin, 
vitamin K2, a full spectrum of metaquinones. Where are we getting zinc and copper and manganese and molybdenum? Well, this is where animal foods really shine and plant foods start to really pale in comparison. The nutrients we need as humans are in animals. There are some in plants, but they are, are, they are less robust, they are less bioavailable, and there are many that are missing from plants in general. So I'll say something controversial right now, but it's a very important summary statement up to this point in the podcast. And this statement is that all of the nutrients found in plants can be obtained in animal foods in more bioavailable forms, and the reverse is not true. Animal foods contain many nutrients that are not found at all or in any appreciable amount in the plant kingdom. Hmm. Things like creatine, carnitine, choline, carnosine, K2, B12, biotin, riboflavin, the list goes on and on, zinc, iron, copper. There are so many minerals and nutrients that are simply either not found in plants or found in very small amounts in very, very paltry bioavailable sources. So this kind of goes back to the first notion that I was talking about, that there's a real inequality between the value of animal foods and plant foods in our diet. People mm -hmm. think that they're eating plant foods for nutrients, but if you really eat animal foods nose to tail, there are no nutrients that you cannot get from that. Okay. And I'll repeat that. If you eat animal foods nose to tail, there are no nutrients you cannot get from that. And so when I say that, immediately people say, what about vitamin C? And the shocker is that there is plenty of vitamin C in animal foods. This is widely documented. Again, it's on the heartandsoil.co from slash Rogan show notes. There's a whole heading vitamin C. There's vitamin C in animal foods. In fresh animal foods, there is vitamin C. And I think that it's, if you really look at the literature for vitamin C, it's just not clear that mega doses are in any way beneficial for humans. And I think that the, the needed dose of vitamin C is much lower than we think it is. However, the point is just that there are no nutrients in plant foods that you cannot get in animal foods. Everything a human needs to thrive, you can get from animals. And so when I make that statement, there are all sorts of rebuttals and questions. What about fiber? What about polyphenols? We can go down any of those rabbit holes you'd like. But I just wanted to make the point that if you're going to eat this way, eating just meat is not the way to do it. You want to get organs. You want to eat nose to tail. It's right. a good start, but you need a little more. Yeah. And um, for people who have a pancreas that works, carbohydrates are not the enemy, but understand that certain sources of carbohydrates are going to be more toxic than others. And I'll just say this, um, that in someone who is type one diabetic on a carnivore diet, I've seen people's insulin use go way, way down. There are also published case studies of reversal of type one diabetes in young children in who it is caught quickly. So there's a nine-year-old a uh, published case study of a nine-year-old who they saw C-peptide declining, they saw insulin declining, the child was shifted to a nose-to-tail carnivore diet, and they saw a recovery of C-peptide. Now, in many autoimmune diseases, whether it's autoimmune thyroid or autoimmune type 1 diabetes, it has to do with how much of the gland is preserved. But the underlying question is, why is the gland being attacked by the immune system in the first place? Mm -hmm. Is there something triggering it? And I think that that's a reasonable hypothesis to say there's something in the diet of these kids that is causing the pancreas to be attacked by the immune system. Now, whether that thing is cow's milk or an egg white or a plant is questionable. But I think that if, if kids start to have issues with this and we put them on a simple type of animal-based protocol without milk, without egg whites and without plants, this can be very helpful and we can understand why the body is attacking the pancreas. Or if someone has Hashimoto's, why is the body attacking the thyroid? Or in the case of all the autoimmune diseases, asking the question, why is the body attacking this organ? Whether it's antiphospholipid syndrome or et cetera, like it usually has to do with our diet. And there is something in the diet that is triggering the immune system. And that's a very radical notion for Western medicine, but I think it's one that cannot be ignored. So Taking all that into consideration, I'll just throw it back to you and see if you have any questions and ask you where you want to go next. Yeah, I'm going to run through some listener questions if you don't mind. Uh, the, the first one is that a person heard that carnivore eating builds insulin resistance, and I wanted to know what you thought of that. Gvoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes, ages 2 and above. Not only is Gvoke Hypopen simple to administer, 
but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. I don't think that we consider blood glucose meters closely enough, meaning that we'll take whichever one the doctor gives us, and we don't stop to wonder how accurate they are or how easy they are to use. The Contour Next One blood glucose meter is all of those things. It's incredibly accurate. It's incredibly easy to use. It has a super bright light and an easy to read screen. Even has like these little color coded lights. You set a range for where you want your blood sugar. And when you test and the range is like within, the light turns green. If it's outside of the range, it turns red. It's an easy way kind of for a sleepy mind to think, okay, that's right. And for those of you who are using your meters for your children, this one's super simple to use, easy to hold, and it even allows you to go back in for a second chance test. So if you hit some blood, don't get quite enough, you can go back without ruining the quality of the test. Some people even find that the Contour Next One meter and the test strips are less expensive when they pay cash than when it goes through their insurance. This may or may not be true for you, but you can find out at contournext.com forward slash juice box. And this is a complete link. There's going to be information there for you to find out about strip saving programs, whether or not you can actually get a free Contour Next One meter. There's other resources including information about the Contour Next One app that's available for iPhone or Android. Just to add a little more oomph to that great meter. You get to see your readings right there on your phone. It's going to help you make better decisions. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. The Contour Next One is absolutely the most accurate and easy to use meter my daughter has ever had. There are links to the Contour Next One Meter, Gvoke Hypopen, and all of the other sponsors, including Omnipod, Dexcom, Touched by Type One, right there in the show notes of your podcast player and at juiceboxpodcast.com. All right, let's get back to Paul and the listener submitted questions. What was that very first question again? A person heard that carnivore eating builds insulin resistance, and I wanted to know what you thought of that. Insulin resistance is a complex topic. It's usually used as a pathological term. So carnivore eating does not cause pathological insulin resistance or metabolic dysfunction. Ketogenic diets, low carbohydrate diets, by necessity result in physiologic insulin resistance. And that is our body's way of partitioning glucose for tissues that need it, like the brain, the testicles, the ovaries, the adrenals, the red blood cells, and sparing it at the level of the muscles. Mm -hmm. That's normal physiology. So if someone says low carb or a ketogenic diet results in insulin resistance, that's completely true, but it's physiologic insulin resistance and it's glucose sparing. That's a very different physiologic state than pathological insulin resistance or metabolic dysfunction. So- There's nuance there, and I've talked about it. I don't like the term insulin resistance because without insulin resistance, everyone listening to this podcast would be dead. Um, Many people develop some low level of insulin resistance at the level of the muscle with an overnight fast, or if they've gotten sick and haven't eaten for 24 or 36 hours. Mm -hmm. or So physiologic insulin resistance is necessary for human life, and it has to do with which tissue is going to be most responsive to insulin. It's normal physiology. Yeah. I, I I found talking to people, because I don't use the term either for different reasons, because when I'm talking to people about how much insulin they need to combat a certain food, they I find that they're like, well, I became insulin resistant. And I usually say, well, I think what happened was you ate something that is that needs a ton of this insulin, and it didn't fit into your theory about how much I usually use for this many carbs. And, and I think insulin resistance in the type 1 diabetes community uh, the the term gets a little bastardized away from the medical um, meaning of it. So um, it's it's complicated, right? Because yeah. then the real thing we're dealing with here is metabolic dysfunction and pathological insulin resistance. And I think that there's 
pretty good evidence. And I've spoken about this on my podcast, which is called Fundamental Health, um, with a number of people. It's an ongoing discussion that I have. I think that in humans, when our fat cells become too large, this is adipocyte hypertrophy. Um, there is There can be associated an impairment of adipogenesis, which is the expansion of the fat cell mass. And that's adipocyte hyperplasia. And there are compounds, specifically compounds from seed oils, excess omega-6 leading to breakdown products like 4-HNE and other 9 and 13 HODE mm -hmm. that appear to contribute to disordered signaling at the level of the fat cell. And if the fat cells become too big, they start to burst their buttons and spew out free fatty acids and other inflammatory mediators that signal pathological insulin resistance or metabolic dysfunction. Now, it is possible for someone with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes to be consuming lots of linoleic acid, lots of seed oils, and potentially be having their fat cells grow so much that they are metabolically dysfunctional. They do have underlying insulin resistance, but there's a lot of nuance here in terms of how insulin is responding at the cellular level. And I think that this gets back to another thing for both type one or type two diabetics. You want your tissues to respond to insulin when it's around. Mm -hmm. That's very clear. And you want your body to decide when the tissues will respond to insulin and when they will not. If you are fasting, you want your bodies to not respond to insulin so that you can spare the glucose for other places. Because mm -hmm. as you suggested, people always have a basal level of insulin. Even when I check my fasting insulin and it's three, there's always a little bit of insulin around. And if some of my tissues were not partitioning how they respond to that insulin after an overnight fast, then all the glucose would get taken up by my muscle cells or somewhere else, and there would be none left in my blood. Mm. And suddenly my liver would have to make glucose. It would be a major problem. Yeah. So there's a lot of partitioning of nutrients and people can become metabolically dysfunctional or have this pathological insulin resistance develop if the diet is not correct. If we set aside carnivore eating for a second, and I said to you, to make a positive change in your life, you should have uh, l less sugar or no sugar, uh, stay away from grains and flour and processed oils. Would that in general make most people healthier? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a huge step in the right direction. Okay. But think about how many foods that would disqualify. Yes, I do. I think about, I've been thinking about bread for six days, Paul. <laughs> Very soon, very soon your, your, your connection with bread will be severed and you'll be a, a stronger human because of it. And again, it's not to say that carbohydrates are the enemy, but my concern is that wheat is particularly immunogenic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, um, people who have uh, chronic kidney disease, if they were going to switch over to this way of eating, do they need to get a, a full checkup with their doctor before they start? This person asks, uh, because of high proteins in the diet, it could elevate creatine in people with kidney chronic kidney disease. Is that something you know about? Yeah, this is important to consider. So in healthy individuals, more protein is not bad for your kidneys, nor is it bad for your liver. Mm -hmm. And one of the breakdown products of creatine is creatinine. And we use creatinine as a surrogate marker for kidney function. The kidneys don't release creatinine when they're hurt. It's the excretion versus reabsorption of creatinine in the tubules in the kidney that give us a sense of how well the kidney is filtering things. We use that to calculate a glomerular filtration rate. So sometimes when people are eating more protein, they will see the creatinine rise. But if that's the case, they should also get a cystatin C, which is another measure of kidney function. Again, neither of these are direct measures of kidney function. They're both surrogates. You get a cystatin C to get a sense of what the kidney is really doing. Someone with chronic kidney disease is a totally different story. The jury's still out here. But if you already have damaged kidneys, you may need to check your lipids or excuse me, your, your, your blood markers closely because it is possible that your body won't be able to handle that much protein, in which case you'd want to do a slightly lower protein diet. Mm. You could still do an animal-based diet, but you may not be able to handle that much protein because damaged tissue is damaged tissue. A okay. pancreas that's damaged isn't going to start working. Kidneys that are damaged are not going to start working. Right. If you have normal healthy kidneys, you'll be fine with more protein. Damaged kidneys are like damaged pancreas damaged thyroids, et cetera. Right. So definitely check with a doctor. So this came up a bunch and I found this in my own life. Like the idea of eating just carnivore, how do I do that? A, in uh, an affordable way? How do I do it for people who are maybe trying to make a change who are picky and talk a little bit about the quality of the meat? I have found myself this week overwhelmingly thinking about something I heard you say 
somewhere else about if a cow eats grain to grow, I am getting the grain through the cow's meat. Is that right? Well, no? sort of. <laughs> okay. So why do people say grass fed, grass uh, finished all the time about uh, it seems to be an indicator of quality meat. Why? I guess. Why is that? Because that's a species appropriate diet for a ruminant like a cow or a buffalo or a bison or a deer or an elk or a pronghorn. Those animals are not meant to eat large amounts of grain. And so what happens when those animals eat large amounts of grain is they get sick and they get more intramuscular fat. And that's why they have more marbling on their fat. So nutritionally, grass-fed, grass-finished meat and grass-fed, grain-finished meat are not that much different. My problem with grain-finished meat is twofold. Number one, it supports an industry that is factory farming, which is not something we should be supporting in the United States and doesn't need to be there. There's plenty of land and resources to make all of our meat grass-fed and grass-finished. Mm -hmm. The other thing to realize is that when you grain-finish meat, there are many things in the meat that are sort of toxic that are there because of what's on the grains that are fed to the animals. They're held in pens and they're fed grains that can be moldy. They're full of pesticides. Sometimes they're fed plastic or byproducts or cookies or pla and just all kinds of crap that grain quote finished animals get fed. You can look this up. And so the, you know, the, the, um, the USDA allows animals to consume a certain amount of plastic in their feed when they're grain finished. And so they're just getting so much lower quality food. A lot of the toxins in that, whether it's a pesticide or a, um, or um, a mold toxin are going to accumulate in those animals. The animal is not healthy. So grass-fed, grass-finished is just a species-appropriate diet okay. for the cows. It's, it's not only protecting the land, because when animals graze on land in that way, it's good for the land. If we want to have lands that continue to be fertile for many generations, for your daughter, for her daughters and sons, for generations to come, this way of eating, this way of raising cattle on land as they're supposed to be grass finishing and grass feeding mm -hmm. is really better for the land as well. It results in more carbon sequestration into the soil. It's called regenerative agriculture, and it results in so many good things. The land is healthier. The animals are healthier. The grass is healthier. It's the way that bison and elk and ruminant animals, that is animals with a rumen, cloven hooved animals, have been living in North America and all over the world for millions of years it's practiced at farms like white oak pastures. That is the only type of animal that we source from at heart and soil. That's really the name is heart and soil. It's regenerative agriculture is a huge part of our mission in general. And mm -hmm. I, with my podcast, support farms that are doing this type of agriculture because it's, it produces better quality meat and it also protects the land. I mean, just like monocrop agriculture with plants is very bad for the land. It strips off the nutrients and creates infertile land, grass fed, fed, but grain finished animals that are in clustered animal feeding operations are not good for the land. They're basically creating soil that's unhealthy. They're creating animals that are mistreated. And it's not thinking long term about how those animals are contributing to the health of the ecosystem. So it just works better to do grass fed, grass finished. That's what we should be doing as humans. That's the only responsible way to eat animals. I understand. Okay. I, I, I appreciate it because sometimes you hear terms and you're just like, I don't know what anybody's saying. Right. Sure. <laughs> um, let me see. Where is my, sorry. I just got off my thing for some reason. Hold on a second. Notes. Paul. There we go. Um, I'd like to understand metabolic health because I, I'm hearing people saying that a lot. I think I understand, but I don't know that I do. And I wonder what the, the clear definition of it is. So we touched on it earlier. Metabolic health is the way that your body is partitioning nutrients and responding to hormones like insulin in the proper way. Metabolic health is what is achieved in the human organism when we eat a species appropriate diet. Mm -hmm. It's fat cells that are not overly hypertrophied. It's a lack of uh, sort of a leak of inflammatory mediators from immune cells and fat cells in the human body. It's a state that gets, that we end up in as humans when we're eating like our ancestors have, it's, it's, people will say health is not the absence of disease, but metabolic health is when the body's hormonal and I would say metabolic systems work well together. They partition nutrients properly, glucose, free fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol, 
and they are all the tissues of the body are responding to the delicate symphony of hormones in the way that they should be. So I think that we, many of us know what metabolic health looks like. It looks like uh, a bright mood. It looks like recovery from um, workout sessions. It, it, it looks like a healthy libido and sleep and good body composition. And that's what it looks like and what it feels like. And at a physiological level, it's all of the body systems working in the way they should be and not being burdened by, you might call it cellular rust or biochemical rust, all these kinds of things. Does that make sense? It does. And it makes me feel like it makes me feel like there are certain things, and this is not me just talking, you know, like parroting back to you, but I'm getting older. I definitely wasn't raised well uh, around food. I grew up in a broke household. They fed us what they had, that kind of thing. But as I get older, it just occurs to me that there are just there are natural things to take in, and there are things that our bodies aren't meant to have. A lot of our food is built out of things that they aren't meant to have. And before you know it, some of those things seem to have a hold on you. I think sugar is a great example. I don't know the exact quote, but you know they say sugar is as addictive as anything else that we can put into our body that's addictive, right? And so you describe, when you're describing metabolic health, I feel like you're describing a person who's living the way you're naturally supposed to live versus a person who's under the influence of something that their body is either fighting against or not melding well with. I don't know if, the, if did that miss me or did it, does that sound reasonable to you? That's totally reasonable. Okay. I would agree. It's a state of evolutionary inconsistency in what we're eating and what our genetics are asking us to be doing. Okay. So it's a genetic environmental mismatch with most of the environment in this situation being comprised of the foods that we're eating, but it can also be other environmental things. Maybe we're not getting enough sun or, right. you know, All these kind of, of things. Stuff. Yeah. Well, so. I also heard you say that you were a continuous glucose monitor, which a lot of people listening are wearing right now. And I'm very interested in what you learned about the impact of protein on your blood sugar? Like, sure. Where, where do you see it hit? How long does it take to clear? Like that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I, I, I've worn a number of continuous glucose monitors and um, they were mainly done because I wanted to include carbohydrates in my carnivore diet. And so uh, basically I have done days with no carbohydrates and I've done days with moderate amounts of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. I generally eat twice a day. And I will do some 16 plus hour sort of fasting, intermittent fasting window most days. So I'll eat breakfast and a late lunch. And what I saw with continuous glucose monitor was that carbohydrates like honey would spike my blood sugar for a very short amount of time. And then it would return to normal very quickly. So the area under the curve was very small, mm -hmm. which I think is a great indicator of metabolic health. And basically per carbohydrate, there was the area under the curve was basically the same or, or comparable. Didn't matter what carbohydrate I used. Simpler carbohydrates would spike my blood sugar up a little higher, maybe 130, 140 milligrams per deciliter from a baseline of between 70 and 80 milligrams per deciliter. And simple, simpler carbohydrates would then have it come back to normal within 30, 45 minutes and most an hour more complex carbohydrates, if we could consider it this way, I experimented with white rice, which is basically amylose, would spike it lower, but the peak might be a little bit wider. So if you actually integrated the peak, the area under the curve might be pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I experimented with things like kabocha squash or fruit and tended to see the same pattern that there wasn't a huge difference for me in terms of carbohydrates, in terms of the actual area under the curve. But as we were discussing at the beginning of the podcast, the, the phenotype, the actual visual look of that curve was very different. And I'm sure that my body was using insulin in different ways based on those different things that I was eating. So for instance, when I had honey, I would imagine based on the response that my body would have a higher postprandial insulin response because it spiked my blood sugar higher. Right. And with rice that my blood sugar... Um, that my insulin, my postprandial insulin was a lot lower. Now I wasn't checking my postprandial insulin. I'm just making inferences here, but I do think that the, the insulin response is different between those carbohydrates. And I don't think that any of those postprandial glucose responses were pathological. And they all indicated to me that I was metabolically healthy because the blood glucose would respond quickly, return to normal, and my baseline stayed very good. You can really see with a continuous glucose monitor 
the difference in the postprandial glucose level between someone who is metabolically healthy and metabolically unwell. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you'd had a vegan on the podcast previously, and I've seen a number of CGMs from vegans uh, that are published on their their Instagrams and their postprandial glucose levels do not look healthy. Okay. They have very broad peaks. They go up and down. They have long postprandial uh, sort of increases. And the area under their curves postprandially is massive. That's exactly what you do not want and why a, a glucose monitor, a continuous glucose monitor is so valuable. It's really an oral glucose tolerance test multiple times a day. And by looking at the shape and the area under the curve of those postprandial glucose um, numbers, you can get a real sense of how your body responds. So you it, specifically asked me about protein. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like you eat a big steak, nothing else in it. Did you see any rise at all? Doesn't Even really hours move. later? Doesn't move. No. Okay. So a working pancreas can handle that. Now what happens in a person with type one is that you can, you can have a mixed meal of, of some carbs with, with beef in it as an example. And hours and hours later, after the insulin you've used to kind of quell the first try of the rise, I think what happens is as the the beef gets broken down or meat gets the protein gets broken down, it gets translated into glucose. Is that right? Yeah. So this is a process called gluconeogenesis. Mm -hmm. And canonically, we think of gluconeogenesis as demand driven. But observationally, I do think there is evidence that if you push a whole bunch of protein into your body, your postprandial glucose is going to be a little higher in, in many individuals, at mm -hmm. least a little bit. Yeah. So I think I might see a small increase in my postprandial glucose if I eat a steak, but there, I think that if in, there is some degree, I think of supply driven gluconeogenesis in people. And so both amino acids and carbohydrates, I mean, carbohydrates get broken down into glucose, oh, many sure. amino acids, yeah. many amino acids are gluconeogenic and can become glucose as well. And so the only thing that really will not go to glucose is fat. Mm -hmm. So this is perhaps a benefit of a ketogenic diet. But one of the things we know observationally is that if you're on a ketogenic diet and you eat a lot of protein, your ketones will go down. Okay. And that is because your body is doing gluconeogenesis, at least from everything we can see there in a supply driven manner. Hmm. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that the goal, as you suggested in type one diabetes is to keep your overall glucose as low as possible to keep your hemoglobin A1C low. You don't want large postprandial responses. And right. so you want to try and understand how much insulin you need. Now, like I said, a really viable strategy is by doing a low carb strategy. It doesn't have to be zero carb, but doing a low carbohydrate strategy with lots of meat and organs, I think works very well for people and will decrease the overall insulin usage. Oh, I believe, I believe way. that certainly. I, um, I, it's funny uh, when you do what I do, Sometimes you hear from people who are like, you know, the carbs are what's wrong. And I sort of maintain that I can't, I'm not in control of how people eat, but, but I, I can make an in, indent in how they understand how their insulin works. So if they decide to eat vegan or they decide to eat carnivore, or they decide to eat a classic American, you know, kind of lifestyle, I just want them to understand how to use insulin between all of them. But specifically speaking about a carnivore diet, I, I think as I'm considering it and I know how insulin works, it would be much easier and use much less insulin. I don't see another way around it, honestly. I think it would be much easier yeah. and use a whole lot less insulin and it would give you nutrients that you need. And then the key, other key thing there is that eliminating the vegetable oils, I think would improve insulin use long-term. So yeah, let, just do. that's a good point. And, and is that, what does the, what do those vegetable oils do to your fat cells? So this is a little esoteric. There's a number of podcasts, like I said, on my podcast where I talk about this, but at the level of the mitochondria, polyunsaturated fats appear to change or break the normal cellular signaling for quote satiety, meaning that when you eat lots of polyunsaturated fatty acids, it appears to allow the fat cells to hold the doors open so that more things are going into your fat cells so that your fat cells grow more, right? So that your more of the nutrients, more of the glucose, more of the free fatty acids, more of the triglycerides go into your fat cells because the normal stop signal at the level of the fat cell or other cells in the body, even muscle cells is not there. So the polyunsaturated fats are holding open the door for nutrients too long. It's almost like in the summer when you have the air conditioning on 
and your kids leave the door open and all the air conditioning goes out, right? Or in the winter, when you're trying to heat the house and you leave the door open and all this cold air comes in um, or the heat escapes. And so basically polyunsaturated fats appear to leave the door to your house open. And, and too many of these nutrients are coming in. They're causing fat cell distension and leading to major problems. Hmm. There's also a lot of good evidence that excess amounts of these polyunsaturated fats damage delicate lipids in the mitochondrial cell membrane called cardiolipin. And that can lead to uh, difficulties with mitochondrial signaling as well. So they're damaging the mitochondria in so many ways. And the mitochondria, depending on the cell type they're in, are critical fat sensors, or I should say at least critical nutrient sensors. And that leads to metabolic dysfunction. Does that make sense? It does. Is it important to pick a diet and stick with it? Like, is it hard on your body? Like if I just ate carnivore for six months and all of a sudden I just had this thought in my head and I was like, I am going to have a piece of cheesecake. And that happened and it led me back into another way of life. Is that harder on me than just never having done it at all? Is it difficult for your body to swing back and forth like that? I mean, you have to imagine that evolutionarily our bodies would have had different things at different times of the year. There were seasonal fluctuations in carbohydrates, depending where you are in the world, Mm -hmm. whether it's honey is available or fruit is available. And so I think that In general, if you're talking about eating, quote, real food or non-processed food, your body can handle a lot of different things. We spoke earlier about the problems immunologically with many grains like wheat and the lectins that are associated there, but I think your body can do that. I think that a lot of times if you were to eat a carnivore diet or a carnivore-ish type diet, which... I outline all of these in my book, which is called the carnivore code. Mm -hmm. And I give eating plans and, you know, a carnivore diet, like I said, doesn't have to be as strict as all meat and organs. It can include less toxic plant foods. Um, But if you, if you were to eat that way and then to just eat some, some cheesecake, your body would be fine. I don't think you would feel good. I think you would get a very strong signal. In fact, a much stronger signal than normal from your body that, whoa, what you did really stressed me out. And so I think sometimes people interpret that as that's not good for my body. And I think of it as a good thing. Well, Hey, here's your body telling you very, very clearly that this is not a positive thing for you. Look, who am I to tell people how to eat your quality of life? Your listeners quality of life is something that they determine. Um, I'm just interested in offering tools that help people who want to make optimal health, their highest quality of life. But there's nothing good or bad about a piece of cheesecake. If it's totally within somebody's um, autonomous right to eat cheesecake, right? But we just need to understand it's not fueling your optimal health, and it's going to have consequences well, long term. Well, honestly, that's one of the reasons I was excited that you said yes because I've been looking for somebody to talk about this. But most of the people I look into are just very dogmatic about it. It's like this is the way. There's no other way, and that doesn't work for me. I. I I, you're not going to change everybody's mind. My next goal is I hope that somebody listening hears this who eats a carnivore diet and wants to come on and talk about how it really interacts with their diabetes. But this has been a really terrific basis of understanding for it because, like I said, I mean, I, even when you say, like, when you say, like, nose to tail, it, you know, I get a picture in my head of, you know, somebody hunting an animal and and saying, look, this is the only thing we have to eat for the next three months. We have to eat every bit of this thing. And I, uh, I, it, that's not lost on me at all. Uh, I don't care. And by the way, if somebody listening is, you know, like, look, I'm just going to eat vegetables and I don't want to eat animals for moral reasons. I don't have any problem with that at all. I say all the time on here, I don't have any judgment at all about what people do. I just, I just want people to be as healthy as they can. For me personally, the thing you said about oils really resonates with me. Um, I, I cannot make the argument that I should be eating sugar or flour. And I can also tell you that, uh, I don't feel as beholden to the food when I eliminate them. So I don't know that I can keep doing it or that I will. I mean, I'm sure I could. I'm not sure if I will because I also have three other people in my home that are eating different ways. But I, I can't ignore how I feel when I do it. it. It is definitely a better place for me. Which is a great indicator, right? And that's what I would say to people. One of the questions on the document that you shared with me was, about vegan and vegetarian diets and why do vegans and vegetarians always say that they feel so good on these diets? And there are a lot of reasons for this. And there are a lot of individual cases. We can't make a blanket statement, but I think that a lot of times when people go to vegan and vegetarian diets, they are cutting out processed food. So yeah, is a vegan or a vegetarian diet better than the standard American diet? 
Probably so. Yeah. Does that mean you might feel better for a short amount of time? Yes. Do I also think that uh, nutritional deficiencies will develop and that people usually crater and feel horrible? Yes. And I've seen it over and over and over. And I've interviewed multiple ex-vegans on my podcast, Elise Parker, Tim Sheaf, world champion free runner. There are so many people who have done vegan diets and just absolutely failed, not by lack of intention or good morals, but because eating only plants doesn't give humans all of the things they need to thrive. Mm. Now, if someone is listening to this and they are thriving, eating both meat and fruits and vegetables, more power to you. That's fantastic. But really, I think the people that will benefit most from hearing this are those who are confused those who are still struggling, those who have persistent autoimmune disease, those who have persistent inflammatory illness, those who have weight loss problems and they can't fix it, those who have mood issues, those who have sleep issues, and they're not fixing it with their current diet, which might include both plants and meat. Right. And it's hopefully a clarion call to say, hey, plants are not as friendly as you believe they are. You don't need them in your diet to the degree that you have them. Don't make the mistake of making them the biggest part of your diet or thinking that you are getting the majority of your nutrients from them. There are now thousands of people who feel better by eliminating most or all of the plants in their diet. Like I said, I generally don't eat any plant foods. Some days I'll eat white rice. Some days I'll eat honey. Some days I'll eat some fruit, but that's the, that's a minority of my diet. And, uh, but I want them to know there is a flexibility there and it doesn't have to be that way. But ultimately this is for people who are struggling and are not finding answers. It's a tool for those people to think, oh, maybe I can change my diet in this way and feel better. And I hear it time and time again. You know, people can always email me at Heart and Soil. And I hear these stories all the time. People say, oh, I feel so much better. It's just so cool to hear about people getting better from things like eczema or psoriasis or mood disorders or other autoimmune issues mm -hmm. or you know, Sjogren's or ulcerative colitis or thyroid disease or improvements in type one diabetes or type two or massive weight loss or sleep. And that's just really cool. and makes me think we are on to something here. We are on to something. And sure, eliminating processed foods, going vegan and vegetarian, is a great first step in the right direction. I just think you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and choosing to use the least valuable foods on the planet as the majority of your food. I think that's the wrong way to go. Hmm. I listen. I appreciate your um, your perspective and and taking the time to share it with everybody. It's a huge. You must be incredibly uh, busy at the moment. You have the book and everything else going. Um, tell me again the name of the book. So the name of the book is The Carnivore Code. It's on Amazon, etc. What got you, do you, if you have a minute, what, what, uh, personally, how did you make a shift? Because you were a practicing physician. Is that right? Yeah, I still, I still do see some clients, mm -hmm. but I have just felt more called to this type of work, uh, recently. And, um, it's, it's been fun. I really like talking about it. I like podcasting. I like thinking about it. I like sharing ideas in the space. And I think that I can affect more people positively by being, someone that shares ideas at a broader level. Uh, I, I love seeing patients, but it's just not something I can do uh, full time anymore with these other projects. Yeah, it's interesting. It's just, it's great that you saw something at some point that, that made you feel so passionately and that you did it. I, I can't agree with you enough, actually. I, I love uh, the ability to, you know, I help people privately and I'm sure you do as well, but the difference between helping one person and feeling like you help tens of thousands of them, it's, um, it's, it, it makes your time feel better spent, you know? Uh, so I can, uh, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love working with people individually, but I, I think that what you are doing and that what, what I am hopefully doing is affecting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of lives. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Um, so yeah, it's I a agree. Thing. Well, because yeah. of you, I have, um, four New York strip steaks I'm about to smoke. Cause I'm well, I mean, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> is, is there, um, I, I don't feel like we hit on this enough before I let you go. But if somebody's listening to this and they want to do it, but they feel um, financially restrained by it, how can you do this on on a budget? I guess um, it's a uh, it's totally it's a lot easier to do on a budget than people think. If you're including organs in your diet, they're very very cheap, and um, you don't have to get the most expensive cuts of meat. There are farms, Belcampo, White Oak Pastures, others. You can go and get stew meat for eight to nine dollars a pound or seven dollars a pound. You can go to the grocery store and get 
grass fed ground beef for four to five dollars a pound. And that's pretty affordable. I mean, yeah. I think you could do a pretty darn good diet for $15 a day. Now, if there are people out there who can't budget $15 a day to the diet, we could talk about ways to do it. But I think most people could probably partition $15 a day per person to the diet. It just has to do with not buying ribeye steaks in New York strips. Right, right. There are other cuts of meat. You can go in with your friends. You can get a cow yourself. You can talk to farmers. There are plenty of ways to do it. And eating nose to tail, eating liver, um, including desiccated organ supplements like we make it hard in soil. These are not expensive interventions, you know? Okay. Um, you but, know, but don't yeah. eat a hot dog and think you're doing the same thing is the idea. Well, you're not. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, you're not doing the same thing if you're eating a hot dog for so many reasons. But there are more affordable ways to do it. And to be frank with you, um, you know, vegetables and fruit are pretty darn expensive too. So uh, if somebody can't afford to do a carnivore diet, I suspect they're just eating processed food, which is – that's not going to work long term either. Right. You're going to have to cut something else. I think that is really what you just said is really the crux of it is that most people are existing out of bags and boxes. Right. And because it's more affordable, it makes more yield. It's easier to cook. And then and then you it's hard in the moment to see what's coming in the future. And I think that once it gets here, you're so kind of uh, enveloped by it and how not feeling good seems like just how your life is, or I just don't have energy or, you know what I mean? Like, I guess I'm gaining weight cause I get older, that kind of stuff. And yeah. it, just, it probably causality wise, you just probably don't see it happening because it happens so slowly. And then you're, you feel trapped by it, I guess. It's interesting. Yeah. And I, I, I hate that Western medicine gives us these excuses and gives us this, this tired excuse. I'm just getting older. You know, that is BS. Right. Well, <laughs> that is BS. We do not need to accept that. I'm glad. How old are you? 43. Wow. Well, you look terrific. Um, oh, uh, last question. I did not include in the list. Uh, a couple of gay listeners wanted to know if you were uh, single. <laughs> 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 but I think I found out since then that you're married and you have a kid. <laughs> so. No, I don't. I'm oh, no, single. Wait. Okay. I, I'm single um, uh, and I like women. So. Oh, Donnie, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you doing this. Hey, would you let me know if you have a second? How do I get your supplements? And yeah, yeah. So which ones get... would I like? Where would I want to start? I guess. Yeah, yeah. So you go to heartandsoil.co. Okay. It's dot co, and um, there's information there about regenerative agriculture, about nose to tail eating. There's a Joe Rogan Experience show notes page there with in information. You can send me a message through the website. It's There's a contact page and you can just hit the shop now button and you'll see all of our supplements. Um, we have six right now. We're coming out with two or three more in the future. Um, depending when this airs, I think that a good place to start is uh, basically either something like beef organs or lifeblood or histamine immune. Mm -hmm. um, we've had so much interest after Rogan that a few of the products are sold out, but you'll see on the ones that are sold out that there are always other product recommendations. So if you go to the website now, I would consider getting like lifeblood and, um, and a product called histamine immune, which are just different blends of organs. Lifeblood is whole blood, spleen and liver. Histamine immune is lung, as lung, pancreas, liver, spleen, and thymus. They're just great starts to your diet. How long would I want to use them before I imagined I would see some sort of an impact from them? Most people feel it within the first week, man. You want to take about six capsules a day. And I mean, my mom, my sister, we hear from people so many times, like within two or three days, they feel a difference with the Oregon supplements. And, cool. Uh, and then they notice when they don't have them. So it, it's not the type of thing that has to build up. It's it's just unique nutrients in organs that we don't get other places. Things like biotin, choline, folate, riboflavin, K2, et cetera. All right. Cool. I'm going to try it. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And I look forward to hearing from your listeners. Again, there's a contact page on the website if people have questions. Okay. On the Shop Now page, there's a, thing, a, qu a quiz if you have questions about which one to s select for you. And Hopefully people will check out the book too, The Carnivore Code, and just hit me up with questions through the email on the website, and I'm happy to help people if I can. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G-V-O-K-E-G-L-U-C-A-G-O-N dot com forward slash juice box.
I'd also like to thank the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter for sponsoring this podcast. Find out more at contournext.com forward slash juice box. Upgrade your meter. I also want to thank Paul for coming on the show. Like I said, Paul has an incredibly popular podcast, and we were lucky to get him. So whether you eat carnivore or vegan or somewhere in between, it doesn't it's meaningless to me. I'm I'm happy for you if you understand how your food is impacting your body and how that impact needs to be addressed with insulin. So we're going to keep having people on as frequently as possible to talk about different eating styles so that you can figure out what's best for you. In fact, if you are a type 1 who's listening and you eat carnivore, I would love to have you on to talk about how you use your insulin. All of you I just recorded a plant-based episode with Matt. That will be the next How We Eat episode. I have a ton of different ones coming up. But if you have a very specific way of eating, or you have a very firm grasp of how to manage certain eating styles with insulin, I want your voice on the show. Thank you all so much for listening and for supporting the podcast. I will be back very soon. As a matter of fact, my next episode, 401, I'm super excited for you to hear. I just finished... uh, putting it together today. And uh, I might put it out this weekend just to, I don't know, I'm just very excited. Okay. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. You know, I was just thinking as I was getting ready to push stop, I should have Jenny on and talk about how she eats. Ooh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. All right. Now I'm really leaving. Goodbye.